been asked to put these in order of increasing acidity. Now before you start trying to put them in order and trying to compare molecules, you need to take one molecule at a time and just find the most acidic hydrogen within each molecule. So let's just forget about the others for right now. Look at the first one. Where is our most acidic hydrogen? We got hydrogens on carbon, we got hydrogen on nitrogen, hydrogen on carbon. There's nothing on the sulfur. So we're either on carbon or, hydrogen, or nitrogen. We know from our periodic trend, you're more acidic on the nitrogen than you are the carbon. You get more acidic. So that's our most acidic hydrogen. So I'm just gonna circle that. So we know what we're comparing. Let's look at our next one. We've got hydrogen on carbon, hydrogen on carbon. These are on sp3 carbons, these are on sp2 carbons. Those are your most acidic hydrogens right there. That's the best we've got, is on the carbon. Here we've got hydrogen on carbon, hydrogen on nitrogen. We're more acidic on the nitrogen than we are the carbons. So those are our most acidic hydrogens. Here, hydrogen's on carbons, hydrogen on oxygen. You're more acidic on the oxygen than you are the carbon. That's your periodic trend. Okay, so we found the most acidic hydrogen within each molecule. Now we can start comparing molecules. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Hydrogen on nitrogen, on carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Periodic trend says you're the most acidic on the oxygen. That's our most acidic. It said in order of increasing acidity. So that's the most acidic. On the, on the carbon is the least acidic. Okay, so those are pretty obvious. That's from your periodic trend. But the other two, we got to make a decision here. It's hydrogen on a nitrogen and hydrogen on a nitrogen. Huh. So our periodic trend didn't help us. So you want to do periodic trend first, look at hybridization next. Well, hybridization on those nitrogens are the same, so that doesn't help us. Residence next, does either one of them have residence? This one's got residence. That long pair on the nitrogen, that nitrogen has resonance into the ring. I mean, just take them there, that would be fine. You got resonance. This one has no resonance because there's an sp3 carbon that's acting as a roadblock. That nitrogen does not have resonance with the phenyl ring. So resonance makes you more acidic. This hydrogen on this nitrogen is more acidic than the hydrogen on this nitrogen because of that resonance. Okay, so there's our order of acidity. Questions? Okay, let's take a look at our next one. So again, you want to go just look at each molecule individually, highlight your most acidic hydrogen, and then start comparing. Okay, so we've got hydrogens on carbon, hydrogen on oxygen, you're more acidic on the oxygen, so that's our more acidic hydrogen. Hydrogens on carbon, hydrogen on oxygen, you're more acidic on the oxygen. Hydrogen on carbon, hydrogen on oxygen, there's our most acidic hydrogen. Hydrogens on carbons, Hydrogen and oxygen, that's our most acidic. Okay, now we can start comparing molecules. Hmm. It's hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen and oxygen. It's all the same down through there. Man, what do I do? Well, see, the periodic trend's out the door now. Can't use periodic trend. Hybridization, all those oxygens have the same hybridization, so that didn't help me. Now you look for resonance. Well, these are carboxylic acids. You got resonance into the carbonyl. So we got resonance here. Let me just write resonance. That's carboxylic acid. You got resonance. That's carboxylic acid. You got resonance. Is that a carboxylic acid? No, that's an alcohol. That's got no resonance. See, there's no, nowhere I can take the electrons in. There's no double bond or triple bond. This has no resonance. Okay, so we've got one figured out. That one there, the last one, is the least acidic. 
got one of them figured out. Now the other three are all carboxylic acids. They all have that resonance. And resonance is out the door now. We're done. What's left? The only thing that's left is inductive effect. So do we have some inductive effects? This one's got a bromine that can pull electrons. It pulls away. This one has no inductive effects. So this one had inductive. This one has no inductive. Well, no additional inductive. You still have the other option, but they all have that. They all have that, but didn't have a, any additional inductive. And this one's got a bromine, so that one had inductive. We figured out the next one. The next one here, next least acidic, is the one with no inductive effect. So B is next. Now, the other two both had inductive effects. Are there any differences in them? What's the difference? One's further away. One's further away, one's closer. Remember I talked about this inductive effect is like, is like a magnet on a refrigerator. <coughs> The closer it is to the refrigerator, the more pull it has. The further away it is, the less pull. Here it's closer to that hydrogen. It's having to pull through one, two, three, four bonds. Here it's having to pull through one, two, three, four, five bonds. It's got farther to pull. It's not going to have as much pull in this one. The pull is going to be greater here. It's got a greater inductive effect. So this one is going to be more acidic than that one. C is next, and A is the most acidic. Questions? Do you see how to work those? I've had several people come to my office and ask questions about these, and their biggest mistake is they start trying to compare molecules before they even realize what's the most acidic hydrogen. Take them one at a time first. Just look at the molecule, find which one, whatever we're doing. Find your most acidic hydrogen in there. Look at the next one, find the most acidic hydrogen. So circle those, and then you can start comparing molecules. Start looking for differences. And again, always look for periodic trend first, then hybridization, then resonance, and look for inductive effects last. Now if we look at these, let's look at the differences here. We've got full negative charges on three of them when one of them is neutral. In general, your stronger bases will have a full negative charge. Remember, we're trying to go get a proton off of like an acid, off of like an HCl, and it's got partial positive on the hydrogen, partial negative on the chlorine. And so these that's got a full negative, they're going to be stronger attracted to that partial positive. So in general, those with the full negative are going to be stronger bases than the neutral compounds. Acids would just be the opposite. So acids, oftentimes, if your acid has a full positive charge, 
that's going to be a stronger acid than the ones that are neutral. But ones with full negatives is a good strong basis. So we only got one that's neutral. That's going to be your least basis. Okay, it's the least basic because it's neutral. Now, all those others had a full negative charge. Let's look at periodic trend on those. Basicity was the red ones here. Basicity increased as you went up a column and as we went from the right to the left. So I've got negative charge on oxygen versus negative charge on sulfur. You're more basic on the oxygen than you are the sulfur. That oxygen is more basic than the sulfur is. So our sulfur here is next. That is less basic than those oxygen. So those two oxygen ones are going to be more basic. Now, let's see what we have that are a difference here between these. If you look at the difference between these two, this has got some fluorines on it. You got an inductive effect. That inductive effect made things more acidic. But we're not looking at acidity, we're looking at a basicity. So how would that affect basicity? Just the opposite. So if those made things more acidic, they would make things less basic. What is happening is those fluorines are pulling electrons toward them that pulls away from here and pulls away from the option. So what happens is there's not as much negative charge here. It pulls some of those electrons away and it's not a really a full negative charge. It's less, a little bit less than full negative. That one's got a big strong, nothing to pull the electrons away. All that charge stays right there. That's a much stronger base. So your inductive effects, that hurts basicity. That makes things more acidic, but makes things less basic. Your acid base is always the opposite of each other. Okay, so D there is the most basic out of the group. And again, you could also work those by looking at the conjugate acids and comparing those and then taking the opposite. But I didn't think you needed to. Questions? <coughs> okay, our next one. said to, let's see, says to circle the most stable conformation of cis, one methyl, two isopropyl cyclohexane. stable to have the substituent equatorial. Let's just see what we got here. Here, the methyl is axial. Isopropyl is axial. Here it is isopropyl axial, methyl equatorial. Here we're equatorial, equatorial. Here it's axial and equatorial. Okay, more stable equatorial. Okay, I'm just going to circle that one. Got to pay attention to the question. It said draw the most stable conformation for cis 
one methyl, two isopropyl cyclohexane. You've got to be in the cis. Not all these, maybe not all these are cis. Maybe some of these are trans. We better look. Okay. Got to know where your axials and equatorials are. We got hydrogens here. So if you look, there's my hydrogen on those. So here we have hydrogen on top, methyl on the bottom. Here the isopropyl is on top, hydrogen on the bottom. So my substituents is bottom and top. That's trans. That's the wrong compound. We better go through and do all of those. Okay. You gotta know which way you'll miss it if you point them the wrong direction. You won't realize what's on top and what's on bottom. So that's why I said it's important to know how to draw those. Okay, so here we have methyl on top, hydrogen on the bottom. Here the hydrogen's on top, isopropyl on the bottom. So my substituents is top and bottom. Dang it, that's trans. Okay, that's wrong. Do you have any cis's here? Okay, methyl on bottom, isopropyl on bottom. That one is cis. Here, methyl on top, isopropyl on top, that one is also cis. Okay, now, now we can find the most stable for the cis. These are out the door. This, this, this is wrong, it's wrong compound. Now, which one is more stable? So if, let's look at those two cis ones. Here we have the methyl equatorial and the isopropyl axial. Here the methyl is axial and the isopropyl is equatorial. So which one is more stable? What we said this morning, if you have to make a choice, and we are, we've got one of them is axial and one of them is equatorial. We have to make a choice. The larger one prefers to be equatorial. That's the what's more important. Larger group prefers to be equatorial. larger substituent okay so that one is the most stable for the cis so make certain you got the right compound first don't just automatically go to both equatorial. We know equatorial is good, but you got to make certain it's the right compound. Okay, our next one here, any questions on that? So I will have something like that on your exam on Monday. I'll have one of these with the, I'll go ahead and have them drawn out. You just have to tell me which one is more stable or which one is least stable or however, read the question. But, uh, you won't have to draw them out because I get too many answers. <laughs> Everybody, some people have trouble drawing those. Now, the only bad thing, I can't give all the credit on that one. <clears throat> okay, we got some naming here. first one here is one of these bicyclic compounds. So <clears throat> bicyclic is where you have several rings sharing two carbons. Those carbons that are being shared were called bridgehead carbons. These two carbons here are your bridgehead carbons. I'll just go ahead and highlight all the other carbons so you can just see them. Okay, there's all the other carbons in the rings. Remember we said the little space on each side represents that's a bond over top of a bond. There is no carbon right there. Okay, so all total we've got uh, looks like nine carbons in the rings. So this is a bicyclo brackets. Nine carbons in the ring total is a no, a no name.
Now we've got to come up with the numbers that are in the, the, the bridges. So the numbers that go in the brackets here is the number of carbons in each bridge listed in decreasing order. So we list our biggest one first. So as we go from bridgehead to bridgehead, if you go around to the left, look at how many green carbons you come across. You got one, two, three, four, and then I'm back to the other bridgehead. So there's four in this bridge. If you go around to the right, how many green carbons we got? One, two, and back to the bridgehead. Got two carbons in that bridge. If you go over the top, there's one carbon in that bridge. So that's the numbers that go in the brackets. List the biggest one first. This is a 421, bicycle 421, no name. Now, we have a methyl group hanging off out here that I need to, to, to mention. And a methyl group hanging out there. So we'll have methyl, but I need to tell where the methyl is. Where is that methyl? So if you recall, our numbering for these, our rules said we number a bridgehead carbon, number one, and then you must proceed into the largest bridges first. So we must number into that four carbon bridge first. We start with one of these two red carbons. You have to figure out which one you start with. The correct one is to start with the first one. If you start with the back one as number one, you'll see you'll get a higher number for the method. You gotta figure out which one is number one it all depends. You're trying to get a smaller number for that methyl as possible. So if I make this first one the number one, go into the bigger bridge first. Two, three, four, five. Then I'm back to the other bridge. And there's six. Now I got, I've, done, I've finished the four carbon bridge. Now I'm going to go into the two carbon bridge. There's seven, eight. Now I finished that one. Now last I go into the one carbon bridge. There's carbon number nine. So the smallest number we can get for the methyl group is carbon number seven. This is a seven methyl bicyclo two four two one no name. Questions on that? Next one, we have another bicycle compound. See, we have two carbons that's being shared between multiple rings. That's my bridge eight carbons right there that I got in red. These carbons here in the green, that's their bridges. Know this is a bicyclo brackets. That's the numbers in the bridges. And then our our parent name, our alkane name, is the total number of carbons there in the rings. So we've got seven. That's a heptane. Oh, wait a minute. Got heptane, but I've got a double bond. It's not an alkane. What do I do with that? Well, we know what to do. You change your ending. If it didn't have a double bond, it'd be a heptane because there is seven carbons in the rings. So we change your ending from A and E to E and E. Now I need to tell the position of the double bond. So I'm going to leave a spot there for the number. I'll have to tell where that is in a moment. But let's take care of our bracket here first. So that's the number of carbons in each bridge. As you go from bridgehead to bridgehead, if you go around to the right, there's three carbons in that bridge. If you go around to the left, there's two carbons in that bridge. And if you go straight across, there's zero carbons in that bridge. Now, our rule said we must start with a bridgehead carbon as number one. We must go into the bigger bridge first. So you need to figure out which one is number one. And you can try it both ways. This one is, this one will give us the smaller number. So we'll start here. 
You must go into the bigger bridge first. Two, three, four, five. Then you go into the two carbon bridge next. Six, seven, and we're done with the number. So this, the smallest number we can get for the alkene is the number six position. So I'm going to put the six there in front of the ene. It's just an easier spot to see it. You can also put the six out in front of all of this. So I can put the six here in front of all of this, but I like it in front of the ene better. Now, the last thing we have left is an ethyl group hanging there off of carbon number six. So that would, our substituents go out the very, very front. So this is a six ethyl. So six ethyl bicyclo 320 hept 16. Questions? That one was pretty nasty. Two rings here, but this is not a dicyclo because we don't have two carbons being shared amongst both rings. See, we had to have those bridge heads. See, those red carbons were in this ring, and both of those red carbons were in that ring. They're being shared between multiple rings. I don't have any carbons that are being shared that's in both rings. I do have two rings, but I don't have carbons that are in both. So this is not a bicyclone. This is just plain cyclone. Okay, now, which one is the parent? We go with the bigger one. We're going to go with the one alcohol takes precedence over everything, so we definitely want the one with the alcohol in it. So this one has six carbons. Six carbons as an alkane would be cyclohexane. It's not an alkane. It's an alkene. So we change your ending from A and E to E and E. And not only is it an alkene, it's an alcohol. So alcohol, you drop the E and add OL. Now I need to tell the position of all that. Alcohol takes precedence in numbering. So on a ring, you can start anywhere. Anywhere could be number one. And since alcohol takes precedence over everything, we're going to make it carbon, on carbon number one. Now the alkene takes precedence over substituents. So I want, next I want the smallest number possible for the alkene because it takes precedence over all substituents and this is just a substituent hanging off. Alcohol beats out alkenes and alkenes beat out substituents. So we need to go counterclockwise in this case to get the smallest number possible for that alkene. So the alkene starts on carbon number three. I'm going to put the three there in front of the ene. Alcohol is on carbon number one. You don't have to put the one. I'll put the one here. I don't think I did on the answer key. You don't have to because it has to be the one position in the ring. So if you want to put it, nothing wrong with it, but you don't have to. So I'll take it off there. But if you want to put it, nothing wrong with that. Now, on carbon number five, we have this substituent hanging off. As a substituent, that's a cyclopropyl or alkyl substituents in the YL. That's a cyclopropyl substituent. Again, ends in YL is your substituent name. Okay, so we're finished. It's five cyclopropyl cyclohex 3 ene all. Or you can make it a one all if you want to put that one over there. Questions? Um, I have a question. Yes. Wouldn't it have lower numbering if you were on the other way? Let's see.
I did that, then my alkene starts on carbon number four. Alkene takes precedence over the substituent. Yeah, I have a smaller number for my substituent, but it doesn't matter. Alkene takes precedence over the substituent. All you care about is that alkene. Alcohol first. Alcohol beats everything. We're trying to get as small a number as we can for the alcohol. Then we're trying to get as small a number as possible for the alkene. Then you worry about the substituents. So I can't do that. That's a good question. That's a common mistake that a lot of people don't understand, so that's a good question. Question, other question. So would it be the same for alkyne? Yes. Okay. So Your you alkyne will take precedence over any substituent. What comes first, alkyne or alkene? I did not cover that and I'm not going to. Okay. I, won't put, I won't do that to you on the test. I won't have both of those. That one is really confusing. It's confusing. Alkenes actually beat alkynes in numbering, but alkynes go at the end as far as like the parent name. It goes at the end because of alphabetical order. It gets confusing, so I'm not going to do one of those. But again, if you have an alcohol, try to get it at the smallest number possible. It takes precedence over everything. And then we had alkenes and alkynes. They're next. Give those the smallest number possible. And the poor substituents, they are last. They write them first, though. Okay. Uh, which one am I on? D. Whoa. Man. So you got a hard one here. Okay, let's get a ring here first. We know the ring is going to be the parent because it's got five carbons. I don't have any chain that's got that many. Remember, we go with the chain as the parent if it has the same number of carbons as the ring or if it has more. The chain is the parent. But the most I have in a chain is two carbons. We got five carbons in the ring, so that's the parent. So five carbons in a ring. Five carbons would be pentane, and a ring is cyclopentane. Let's number our ring. Let's see. So we start with a substituent, and I've got to figure it out here. If I go one, two, three, four, five, that's got a methyl group on carbon number one. And then on carbon number three, oh man, what do I call that? Good question. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Let's see what we got. Let's see. I see a carbon. We got a carbon here. I'm going to make it number one. That's where I'm connected my ring there. There's two. I know if there's two carbons, it's an ethyl group. Right? Two carbons is an ethyl group. If you didn't have that bromine, you would call that ethyl. Okay, it's an ethyl. But, there's a bromo group coming off of carbon number one. This is a one bromo ethyl group and that will all go in parentheses. This is, this is very similar to what we talked about with the branched alkyls. You know, if I had something like this, you know what to call that. IUPAC called this a one Methyl ethyl group. That was a one methyl ethyl group because IUPAC says you're going to make that number one, you number on out, there's two. So there's a methyl coming off the one position, a one methyl, but the subparent was ethyl. This is the same thing here. We've got the ethyl group, but we have a bromo coming off of carbon number one. So it's a one bromo ethyl group. And all of this. All of that is coming off of carbon number three. Now, is the, did I get my numbering right back up here? I made this one number one, and I number round and made this one number three. I could have started here. If I make that one number one, 
and go two, three. Then it's this one is number one and this one's number three. Huh. I got a three one versus a one three. I got a tie. What do I do with a tie? We give the lower one to the first alphabetically. So it's Bethel versus Ethel. Bromos is coming off the Ethel, so it's Ethel versus Bethel. Ethel comes first alphabetically. The blue ones are the correct ones. The red ones there are wrong. This one is wrong. The blue ones are the correct way to number. Let me take the red ones off. Because we had a tie, only when you have a tie, you go give the lower number to the one that comes first alphabetically. Okay, so we got it all, we just got to get it on here. So we got a one, one bromo ethyl group, and then we have a three methyl cyclopentane. So although we hadn't seen anything like this before, if you applied the same rules as what we did with the other branched substituents, you can figure that out. I like a question like that. That separates my people that really know what's going on from, one, from the ones that are trying to memorize everything. Okay. Question, any other questions on that? Okay, our next one here is looking at these Newman projections. It says to circle, I'm not going to draw all those up if you don't mind says to circle the most stable conformation of 1,2-dichloroethane. Now I am going to draw up this first one, A there. I want to show the problem with A. There's a big problem with A. Does anybody see what the problem with A is? So our question said, circle the most stable conformation of 1,2-dichloroethane. This is our front carbon. That's our front carbon. That's carbon number one. Your back carbon is the circle. That circle is carbon number two. That back circle is carbon number two. If you look, both chlorines are on carbon number one. This one is a 1,1-dichloroethane. This one is the wrong compound. So A is out the door right off the bat. It's not even the right compound. All the others are one twos. If you look on all the others there, you have a carbon on the front one, and then there's a carbon on the circle. So you got a chlorine, I said carbon. You got a chlorine, sorry, I misspoke there. You got a chlorine on, on this carbon, you got a chlorine on the circle, so that's a one two. You got a car. Chlorine on carbon number one and chlorine on carbon number two and all the others. So the most stable is to get the chlorines as far away from each other as possible. The least stable is where they're on top of each other. So B was the most stable, D is the least stable. But first of all, you know Dr. Shelby is pretty tricky sometimes. Make certain you got the right compound. And A was the wrong compound. It wasn't even the right compound. Okay, we got some more naming. So that first naming all had cyclic molecules, if you notice. They were all cyclics, and these are ones that are not cyclic. Okay, so let's take care of some of these. So. If you recall, this one here has got an alcohol in it. If you recall our rules for the alcohol said that we must include the carbon bearing the OH 
There's my OH. I must include this carbon that I'm highlighting in red. You must include that in your parent chain. Even if you have a longer chain somewhere else in the molecule, can't use it. Got to find the longest chain that has that red carbon. The longest chain that has that red carbon is this one. There is a longer chain somewhere else. If you went straight across, that's a bigger chain, but can't use it. Got to find the one that contains that red carbon. Okay, we're going to number our chain starting at the end that the OH is the closest to. That OH group, alcohol group, takes precedence over all substituents. So here's my carbon number one. Here is number two, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, seven carbons in my parent chain. Seven carbons of an alkane is heptane. We're going to change your ending for the alcohol. You drop the E and add OL, so it's a heptanol. I need to tell the position of that alcohol. You can see it is on carbon number two. You can put the two here in front, or you can put the two in front of the all. Either place is perfectly acceptable. Personally, I like it in front of the all, but you're fine either way. IUPAC accepts either way. Now, we have some substituents to take care of. <clears throat> Let's see, we've got a methyl group here on carbon number four. And we've got a propyl group here that's coming off of carbon number three. And our substituents go out in front alphabetically. So, it's a four methyl. Three propyl, two heptanol, or you can put that two in front of the all. So you can switch this if you prefer. I'm not going to rewrite that. You can switch that either way. It's fine. Questions on that? One? So that one was a little tricky. You might just think you know straight across was the longest chain, but Nope, can't use that one. Even though I had eight carbons across there, can't use it. Okay, so again, we must include the carbon that has the OH. I must include this carbon that I'm highlighting in red. We've got an alkene. Our rules for alkene said you must include both carbons of the double bond in your parent chain. So I have to include all three of those red carbons in my parent chain. So the longest chain that has all of those would be all the carbons in this case. They are all in the chain. We're going to number those. Alcohol takes precedence over the alkene, so we start with the end, the alcohols are the closest to. I've got six carbons. Six carbons is an alkene would be hexane. It's not an alkane. It's an alkene. Let me change your ending. Hexene. Not only is it an alkene, it's an alcohol. Normally for the alcohols, we drop the E and add OL. But there's two of them. So it's a diol. Diol will start with a consonant. So since I have a, since it starts with a consonant, I'm going to leave the E just so it's easier to pronounce. So this is a hexene diol. Now I need to tell the position of everything. The alkene starts on carbon number four. You can put the four in front, or you can put the four in front of the E. Those positions of the alcohols are gonna to have to go right in front of the diol. They are both on carbon number two. So this is a two, two diol. But 
but that four you can put out in front or in front of the E. But those numbers for the alcohol you have to put right in front of it. I can't put everything out front because then you don't know what's what, which one belongs to which. Okay, I've named everything up there. Looks good, right? We're done? Watch those double bonds, watch those alkenes. If you can see whether it's cis or trans, you must indicate that. This one is a trans double bond. See, there's a hydrogen here, hydrogen here. So I've got, see my, my I got a group here on top, and hydrogen on the bottom over here, hydrogen on top, my group, my substituent there, group there is on the bottom. So see, these are on opposite sides of the double bond. They're on opposite sides of the double bond. That's trans. You simply put trans out in front. So if it's shown, if you can tell, you must indicate whether it's cis or trans. So don't forget to look for that on alkenes. Not all alkenes will be cis or trans, but you need to watch for those. Now, I didn't tell those. We had an alkene back there earlier in a ring. Back on 7B and 7C, I didn't tell those in the ring because in a ring you don't have an option. They can only point one way in a ring. So like a 7C there, it's always a cis double bond. You can't have a trans double bond in a ring. It's impossible. Okay, our next one. We're going to find our longest continuous carbon chain. We don't have anything that takes precedence over anything else. There's no alcohols, there's no double bonds, there's no alkynes. All, everything here is equal. It's just substituents. So we need to find our longest continuous carbon chain. If you go straight across, let's see, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. If you go through here, I got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I've got two different ways to get six. Which one do we go with? The rule was if you have a tie in selection for the parent, you choose the one with the most substituents. So the correct one there is the green one. The blue one had two substituents. The green one has got three substituents. So I'm going to take the blue one off. So only when you have a tie, you choose the one with the more substituents. Now, let's number our chain. We want to give the substituents the lowest numbers possible. That would be to start on this end. If you number from the other end, you will have higher numbers. So this one has a bromo on, let's just write it down, bromo on carbon number two. We've got an ethyl on carbon number three. And I've got a methyl on carbon number five. If I had numbered the other direction, if I started with the other end, this would have been a 2, 4, 5. So 2, 3, 5 is, is smaller than 2, 4, 5. So the green one there is correct. Okay, now 6 carbons. 6 carbons is an alkane, is hexane. Our substituents there just go out in front in alphabetical order. I'm going to take those wrong ones off. Just go in alphabetical order. So this is a 2 bromo. 3 ethyl, 5 methyl, hexane. Questions? Okay, still going. Okay, last one.
Now this one's got two alkenes in it. So our rules for alkenes says we must include both carbons of the double bond in our parent chain. I've got another double bond. I must include both of those carbons in my parent chain. So I have to include all four of those. Find the longest chain that has all four of those red carbons. Okay. Now we're going to number the chain with the end the double bonds are the closest to to give them as small a number as possible. That will be to start here. 